डॉक्टर मूर्ति कैन यू हियर मी सर यस यस हाँ ओके सो आई एम गोइंग टू शेयर अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट सेशन ऑन डापक लिपोजोन एंड दैट विल बी स्पोकन बाय डॉक्टर पी सी मनोरिया एंड द is none i am proud to announce that i am going to chair the session a very interesting session and as you know the dr banoria is a past president national president of csi or many committee members of api icc past dean of icp is a past chairman of hypertension council asian pacific society of cardiology and past pre vice president of srsc cardiac society and as you know that he has received many international awards the lifetime achievement award from the abdul kalam abg abdul kalam a special award in cardiology in 2011 at new orleans usa so an organizer many of the Congre uh, international congresses uh, meetings that is the first was a first world congress on cardiometabolic medicine 2019 in mumbai and has also edited 33 books and 65 publication more than 65 publications in the various journals and international journals and has delivered more than 600 lectures in various uh, national and international conferences and he has been a teachers of teachers of decades with a very dynamic leading cardiologist and a practicing uh, physician and i am very proud to chair this session because i am been a student of him from gandhi medical college bhopal uh, i know him for last 5 uh, decades so i hand over the mic to doctor and my co chairman will be dr balbir kalra from delhi and i request dr manoria to start his uh, important uh, session on uh, dapa glyphs on the molecule of the decade thank you sir for the opportunity we should also give dr manoria a big hand yeah yes sir thank you, thank you. Uh, so for the next 12 minutes i'll be talking on uh, this very interesting topic that is dapa glyphs in the molecule of the decade the last decade has witnessed a sea change in cardio diabetology and we have several innovative molecules pcsk9 inhibitors which is powered to excuse ldl to super low levels which we know have a great impact on atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease we have glp1 receptor agonist which decreases slows down ascvd in type 2 diabetes but both these agents are costly and available as injectable therapy and therefore due to this this precludes their widespread use in large number of available patients but sglt2 inhibitor is available as a pill it is cheap it has multifaceted actions and targets all the components of the cardio renal metabolic continuum in the context of heart failure it decreases hospitalization for heart failure in individuals at risk it improves hep rep outcomes diabetics and non diabetics it decreases cardiovascular and all cause mortality as shown by the dapa hf in the context of ckd it slows down the trajectory of ckd and postpones dialysis by 10 to 15 years and in diabetes it produces good glycemic control with little or no hypoglycemia and improvement in the cardiometabolic profile but all of us know no victory can be celebrated unless the masses utilize the drug and the use of innovative sglt2 inhibitors are likely to become widespread in new chair and therefore sglt2 inhibitors are the winner molecule of the decade but the big question the big perplexing question is is lcs glt2 inhibitor i had in the race this i'll try to answer at the end of my talk so let's first see sglt2 inhibitors in heart failure now this is the scenario this was the scenario of heprep prior to sglt2 inhibitors and all of us are very familiar with this scenario 2019 initiated dawn of a new era when the dapa hf trial was presented and this shows improved outcome in heprep patients diabetic as well as non diabetic and dapa laid the first foundation stone of sglt2 inhibitors in heprep diabetics as well as non diabetic 
2020, we had the Emperor trial. This also showed decreased hospitalization for heart failure, but unlike the DAPA HF, failed to show reduction in cardiovascular mortality and all cause mortality. In 2020, we have two other very important trials, the SOLACE WH20 and the SCORE, which were conducted with sotagliflozin, a dual SGLT inhibitor, and both these trials have passed off a panoply of new messages. The first big message is that sotagliflozin in the SOLACE WHF trial was utilized in acute decongestive uh, decompensated heart failure after hemodynamic stabilization, either before discharge or within two days after discharge and showed improved outcome. And the same strategy is being, is being tested in the dictated HFR and the AMPHF trial. The second big message from these trials is that patients with HEPF also showed beneficial results, and we are keenly awaiting the result of the delivered trial in HEPF patients. Now, these are the three front runner SGLT2 inhibitors. All these SGLT2 inhibitors have shown decreased hospitalization for heart failure in patient test risk, that is, they are not in heart failure. The curves, as you see, start separating early, and whether you have an atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or you have only multiple risk factors, both these subset of patients benefited with SGLT2 inhibitors. Now, uh, 2019, we had the DAPA-HF trial, and this tested DAPA 10 milligram with standard of care, with placebo on top of standard of care, uh, 4,744 patients, and the trial was immediately, uh, prematurely terminated uh, because of immense benefit. And this has diabetic HEPREF as well as non-diabetic HEPREF. And the trial included the patient which we commonly see in our day-to-day -day practice. Now, these are the results. The primary endpoint of cardiovascular death, hospitalization for heart failure, or urgent HF visit, decreased by 26%. And look at the NNT, only 21. Cardiovascular death decreased by 18%. Bursting heart failure decreased by 30%. And all-cause mortality also decreased by 17%. DAPA HF has passed on three big messages. Message number one, diabetic HEPREV or non-diabetic HEPREV, both benefited equally, as you can see on the slide, without any risk of hypoglycemia. So if you are using these patients in non-diabetics, you should not be scared of hypoglycemia. The second big message was that DAPA HF trial showed incremental benefit on top of RD. So even if you're on RD, there's incremental benefit. And the third big message is, it is poised to postpone device therapy like LILVAD and even cardiac transplantation. This is the subgroup analysis. You can see patient with IMHA class two benefit more compared to three or four. Those with prior hospitalization benefit more. Those with non-ischemic benefit slightly more. Now, this is a comparison of DAPA H and M for H, and you can see hospitalization for HF, both are nearly same, but DAPA decreased hospitalization for heart failure and whole cause mortality, which was not done by the M for HF trial. And this is a very interesting subgroup analysis. You can see DAPA HF trial showed that DAPA benefit all substrates of ejection fraction. Even when you see the substrate of ejection fraction below 26%, as you can see in all the four endpoints, there is benefit. And therefore, the argument commonly used that emperor failed to show reduction in all cause mortality, reduction in cardiovascular mortality, because these trials had more sick patient, the ejection fraction was comparatively lower than the DAPA H, does not seem appropriate. And if you utilize all the four drugs, the three old drugs and the SGLT2 inhibitors, in an individual at the age of 55 years, you can increase the projected survival by 6.3 years. The mechanisms of action of SGLT2 inhibitors are multiple. You can see on the slide, these are other mechanisms. It also decreases interstitial edema, which is unique to SGLT2 inhibitors. And 
DAPA glucosin, as you know, or rather all SGLT2 inhibitors are very safe agents, and they have provided us a new weapon in the armory to fight the developed stroke on top of all standard therapy. And these agents, and particularly DAPA, has been approved by all the professional bodies for use in HEFREF. Even the 2020 HFA ESC also endorses, and this has been uh, approved in 40 countries all over the globe. It has been approved by all guidelines, the ADA guidelines recommended for those with established HFREF and CKD or at risk for both these subset of patients. And interestingly, the ESC guideline 2019 recommends it's ahead of metformin, so can use even before metformin for both these subset of patients. What about SGLT2 inhibitors and CKD? Now it is very important to remember that heart failure and CKD should never be treated alone because there is a close trust connect between CKD and HF, worsening heart failure, worsen CKD, worsening CKD, worsen heart failure. And therefore, when you are treating these patients, the whole cardiorenal continuum should be targeted and SGLT2 inhibitors are a very effective agent. And don't forget, targeting CKD triggers benefit for HF. And this was the missing link which we have not utilized for many years. Now, whenever any physician or cardiologist is treating heart failure, he must be very well conversant with the stages of CKD as is seen in this slide. And they are based on declining EGFR and increasing albuminuria. Now, this very clearly shows that the initial three CV outcome trials laid the foundation stone for exploring the renal benefits of SGLT2 inhibitors. You can see all these trials showed very good renal benefit, even when the GFR was slightly decreased. And this shows the three dedicated CKD trials. Credence trial was prematurely terminated, EGFR 30 to 90. UACR greater than 300, and DAPA CKD, EGFR 25 to 75, UACR less than, uh, more than 200, and MPA kidney 45 to 75, and UACR more than 200, or even if it is not present. That the peculiar feature of uh, SGLT2 inhibitor is that the renal benefits are a class effect, and roughly, as you can see in this slide, the benefit is by 35 to 45%. Whether you are looking at a CV outcome trial like Emperor H, Canvas, or Declare, or you are looking at the Credence trial or even the DAPA CKD, as well, I show you. The peculiar feature is the more severe is the CKD, the curve starts separating early. So, DAPA CKD, mean EGFR 43, you see the curve starts separating within eight months. Credence, mean EGFR slightly higher 56, the curve starts separating in 10 months. And in DAPA HF, the EGFR is 66. The curve starts separating in 12 months. And in the declare, the EGFR is 85. The curve starts separating in two years. So the more severe is the CKD, the earlier the curve starts separating. And that is indeed a great benefit with the use of these patients. Now, this is an overview of the completed and ongoing uh, uh, agents in dedicated CKD studies. All of us know the normal EGFR is 0.9 ml per year, the decline in GFR. If the patient develops CKD, then the fall increases to 10 ml per minute per year. And the first revolution came with RAS blockers. It improved the declining EGFR from 10 to 4.59. The second revolution came with SGLT2 inhibitors, which further decreased the slowing EGFR from 58 by 58% from 4.59 to 1.85, and the third revolution is on with the Fidelio trial with non-steroidal MRA, uh, uh, MRA antagonists, which have also shown a positive outcome. So in kidney, unlike the heart, we do not have any quick fix for improving renal outcome, but certainly we have three magic bullets now to improve the renal outcome. And look at this, you can postpone dialysis with these agents by 10 to 15 years, which is indeed a great achievement. And this is the DAPA CKD trial, which again was prematurely terminated and showed benefit in diabetic as well as non-diabetic CKD. And the DAPA CKD, like the DAPA HF, laid the first foundation stone of SGLT2 in CKD, irrespective whether the patient is diabetic or non-diabetic. 
and this provides a new opportunity to improve outcomes of CKD. This is the DAPA CKD trial. DAPA 10 milligram tested against placebo on top of standard care. The trial was prematurely terminated at the primary endpoint. You can see sustained EGFR greater than 50% decline in EGFR, ESKD and renal or CVD. There's a 39% statistically significant reduction. All the individual point uh, components of the primary endpoint showed benefit. All subset of patients showed benefit. And this is the renal endpoint. Again, you can see tremendous benefit of 34% uh, in the renal endpoint. Now, this is very important. The mean annual decline in EGFR observed in DAPA CKD was half that seen in the other CKD trials. If you look at this, DAPA has the slowest mean annual decline in EGFR and CKD. So if you use DAPA, your EGFR will decline at the slowest rate compared to all available agents at the present state of time. And all of us know patients of CKD die because of cardiovascular disease. So in all these dedicated trials on kidneys, we have to look at the cardiovascular endpoints. So cardiovascular death hospitalization for heart failure decreased by 29%. All cause mortality 31%. There are multiple mechanism of action. One of the important is that produces efferent arterial constriction, which decreases intraglomerular pressure. There are several other mechanisms. It's a very safe drug, as you can see on the slide. This is the summary which I've already talked about. But another very important thing is these are the seven reasons why focus should always be on kidneys and heart failure. Heart failure can never be treated without focusing on kidneys. And SGLT2 inhibitors, as I've already shown, slows down the trajectory of CKD. SGLT2 inhibitors can be used across the uh, continuum of cardiorenal continuum. Dapagloposin can be used or emperor can be used from stage A heart failure to B to C to D at any level of GFR if it is above 25. So they can be used across the... Now, there's no head-to-head -head trials with the SGLT2 inhibitors. So let's look at the individual achievements of the individual agent. Canaglobuzin has a trial in primary and secondary prevention. That is CANVAS. That is CREDENCE. Uh, and can, CREDENCE is a CKD trial. The Empaglobuzin has the EMPA trial, which is a secondary prevention trial. It does not have any primary prevention trial. And the EMPA is in HEPREP, diabetic and non-diabetics. And look at the DAPA globosin. It has declared trial in primary and secondary prevention. It has DAPA HF trial in diabetic and non-diabetic HEPREP. It has a DAPA CKD trial in diabetic and non-diabetic CKD, which is not present in any of these agents. So when we look at the spectrum of SGLT2 inhibitors, DAPA is certainly ahead in the race because of a panoply of reasons. Firstly, in the DAPA HF trials, they showed decrease in cardiovascular and all cause mortality, not shown by Emperor. Only DAPA has data in non diabetic CKD. DAPA is unique in the sense that it has the slowest mean annual decline in EGFR and it also decreases new onset diabetes by 32%. So DAPA has completed the whole circle. Now, this is the future anticipated ESC, ACC, and other guidelines. And I'm sure that in times to come when these guidelines are released, DAPA will have a class 1B indication and EMPA will have 2AB indication. So DAPA is ahead in the race of SGLT2 and is the molecule of the decade. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Yes. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, yes. Uh, it's an, it was an, such an excellent presentation with a command on the subject. And with the, so much of clarity and crispness of this uh, subtopic, you have really mastered on this topic. And I would appreciate that your slides are well, so excellent and we could appreciate uh, with so clarity. Uh, so with this, I just wanted to have some few questions. Uh, you have only one question. We can running out of time. Okay, right now. Uh, just I wanted to know, sir, can these SGLT2 inhibitors uh, can be used in acute decompensated heart failure, sir? At the moment, they are not approved for acutely compensated heart failure, but there's emerging data from the SOLIS WHF trial where uh, 
soloist where sota glufosin has shown that when these agents are used in adhf after hemodynamic stabilization it has produced good results and even within two days after uh, discharge they were initiated so similar trials are ongoing with uh, dapa and emperor in future i am sure uh, these trials will pave the way just as arni we had the transition trial and it was uh, later on used uh, in ad uh, acute decompensated heart failure so in times to come perhaps uh, we may have data that they may be initiated at the moment no yes sir so last question sir SGLT2 can be it can be used in preserved ejection fraction in patients with the heart failure, sir. No trial of HEPFEP has been read. We are keenly awaiting the trial of uh, Deliver uh, with the DAPA and the other ones, Emperor. But there are reason to speculate. They like may be useful. The first reason is uh, the Solis trial has shown benefit in HEPFEP patients. The Declare trial showed benefit in HEPFEP patients. DAPA decreases interstitial edema, so the fibers may be able to relax better, even though they are not altered in the morphology or other things. And all trials which have failed, they have been acting through neurohormonal modulation, and these pathways have never been tested. So there's hope, but the final results will be decided by the HEPREP trials. I think you should finish the session. Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much, sir, for uh, answering all these uh, questions. And uh, now we have ended with this important session. I hand over the session to Dr. Manoria to uh, start the next session. Thank you very much, sir, for giving uh, this opportunity the, for chairing this session, sir. The next speaker for our conference is Dr. Amrish Agarwal from UAE. All of us know Dr. Amrish Agarwal is a senior consultant cardiologist and associate professor of medicine at the Fuchara Hospital, UAE. He has more than 25 years of experience in Australia, India, and UAE. He's invited faculty and speaker in various international meetings, and he has more than 20 publications in peer reviewed journal and is author of uh, chapters in many books, and international member of editorial boards, and he has been the principal investigator for many international studies and registries such as the Crayfield, Flow, Coal, and so forth. I'll uh, request the chairpersons, Dr. S. B. Gupta and Manokar to conduct this session. Dr. Gupta, please. Uh, good evening, friends. Uh, we have uh, one session on uh, cardiac amyloidosis. As uh, most of us know that uh, so far cardiac amyloidosis, once a person is diagnosed, uh, we think uh, that is not a treatable disease. And normally we take it as a very rare disease. Uh, but however, if we suspect the disease, especially in elderly population, I think cardiac amyloidosis is not so rare. However, in uh, the recent times, uh, there has been a breakthrough as far as the treatment is concerned, especially in uh, certain varieties of hereditary amyloidosis, for which uh, Dr. Amrish Agrawal will be talking about a drug, which is a tougher midis, uh, a dawn of a new era for ATTR amyloidosis. So I'll request uh, Dr. Amrish Agrawal uh, to deliver his talk. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Today I'm going to talk about a new molecule, which is going to be a molecule of the future. Dr. Uh, uh, Manuri has said that uh, no treatment for the heart failure with preserved digestion infection has been shown to be of benefit, but this is one of the molecules in a specific condition has been shown to be of benefit. So as you all know, ATTR amyloidosis is a special uh, fascinating and a very strange disease in which a precursor protein, which is actually a transferritin, is secreted from the liver. This protein has got four subunits, and this actually the subunits tetramer are dissociates into dimer and monomer, and the reforms into the oligomers and forms into an uh, amyloid fibrils, which are actually deposited in the various cardiac tissues, which we see as the cardiac amyloidosis and the peripheral neuropathic amyloidosis. Until few years back, it was a disease which we thought is very uncommon and not very known. But now the clinicians are recognizing all over the world that this disease is actually common. And um, this disease is uh, present in up to 13.3% patients of preserved digestion infection. And the data across the globally is showing that a good number of patients with a severe aortic stenosis who undergo transcatheter aortic valve replacement, that the biopsy can be taken. This can be seen. And further of all, a good chunk of patient with hypercardiomyopathy, where it shares certain phenotypic characteristics is also seen. And it's also seen in the population with the, with the carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, it is seen also. 
So it is a disease with the various protein manifestations and various components which can be seen in the general population. Uh, it is commonly seen to our cardiologist and typically presents with the heart failure, with the plate rejection fraction. But when you look carefully, you will find uh, some speckle appearance of the myocardium, a thickening which is out of proportion to the degree of the blood pressure. And also, if you look at the global longitudinal strain, you can see a typical pattern which is described as the cherry on the ice cone in which the global longitudinal function is preserved at the apexes of the, of the heart and is reduced at the basis of the heart. So this particular typical patient, which you saw in our practice, had a good ejection fraction, but reduced global longitudinal strain of minus 12.5%. It is a disease with a very, very poor prognosis. The data shows historically that once if you have a disease which is the stage three, and when we say the stage three of ATT or cardiomyopathy, it means the person has got a cardiac failure with the elevated BNT and also has got a renal dysfunction. The GFR, which is also affected, the survival can be as low as 1.5 years. And hence, it is important for the clinician to recognize and to treat early down in the practice. So it is a disease where initially there were no treatment, but fortunately, the scientists and the researchers have been working upon different aspects and different areas where we can interfere and have a beneficial effect in the general outcome. For example, we can actually look at the liver and interfere the synthesis of the tetramer in the liver by many mechanisms, the most logical and the most drastic method being liver transplantation. But in addition, there are certain new modalities which have been approved and already undergone phase three trial First of all, there is a small incisional RNA molecule at the level of the liver inside the liver to prevent the production of the thiosteratin. And this is actually a pretty serum. Then there is a antisense polynucleotide molecule, which is anotericin, which can be used to decrease the synthesis of uh, transteratin from the liver. The most popular drug, which currently we are going to talk, is about tafidamis, which is nothing but it uh, actually acts on the rate limiting tetramer dissociation. So what it does, it prevents the dissociation of this tetramer molecule into monomerous oligomers, and these are called as TTR stabilizers. And there are a number of TTR stabilizers which are under development. The common ones are the one tafidamis, but there are certain other, such as the defluxumal and alcopone and pinky for that matter is also effect. We can even act once the patient is in advanced stage, but there's a murder fibrils by acting on the drug, which act on the mullet breakdown. So this includes a non-specific doxycycline. Doxycycline is, as you know, is a compound which uses an antibiotic, but it has got a powerful effect on breakdown of the amylate fibrils, and there are monoclonal antibodies under development. But today we cannot go into all of it. We're going to focus a little bit on the most commercial level of preparation and oral preparation, which is tafadamis, which actually acts on the rate limiting steps. So 2018 was the watershed a, a, a year the ATTR uh, disease, whether it's cardiomyopathy or peripheral neuropathy, because the three drugs underwent phase three trial. One was Trafadamis, one was Petisaran, one is Anotercin, which actually were approved in different indications for the ATTR process. For example, the first two of them were approved for cardiomyopathy. The Petisaran was also approved for hereditary, cardiomyopathy, hereditary neuropathy, and Anotercin was only approved for uh, peripheral neuropathy of the hereditary type of ATTR. Uh, amyloidosis for him. So let us little bit focus on tafadamis, which actually acts on the tetramer transteratin. And as you know, this is the fourth subunits there. In this subunits, there is a pocket. As you can see, this pocket. This is the pocket where the thorexin is stored and is transported inside the blood, as well as the vitamin is also taken in the component. So it's actually a transport protein. So what happens is that tafadamis acts on this particular area, which is like a pangari pouch and establishes the TTR tetromer, thereby preventing is dissociating into the oligomers and the monomers and the trimers, and thereby arresting the process of dissociation and the formation of amyloid fibrils. It does not do anything to the amyloid fibrils, which only deposit the tissues, but actually prevents the toxic effect of amyloid fibrils in the blood and the human tissue. It is actually a synthetic non steroidal benzohexyl derivative, and like we said, it binds to different components of the of the transtheritin, thereby preventing the related limiting steps of dissociation into the monomers. So the doses, different doses have been tested in the in the animal models, and they found at the dose of 60 milligram actually prevents nearly 100 percent breakdown, 100 percent prevention of the breakdown from tetramer to monomer. So by the dose dependent fashion, so 20 milligrams got effect, 
40 milligrams got a more powerful electric, and 60 milligrams, you have nearly 100% inhibition of the rate limiting stuff or dissociation of uh, transthyretin in the blood for him. So number of clinical trials were done, which were exploratory. And in 2018, the result of a main trial, which in, we saw a tephidomis treatment in the patient with transthyretin amylate cardiomyopathy was released. And this was called as the ATTR uh, Act in study investigators led by the person who has done a lot of pioneer work on the clinical era, which is Matthew Mario from the United States and the Claudio Rampesi from the Italy. So these people, they come out with the results of the uh, ATTR Act study. And this ATTR study was by a drug, Tepidemis, which is marketed by Pfizer globally and also in the UAE. So what this included, this included a pool of nearly 431 patients, which actually randomized into the ratio of two is to two is to one is to two, or tephidem is 20 milligram, tephidem is 80 milligram, and placebo. And all these patients at ATA cardiomyopathy, in the initial part, all these patients are biopsy proven amyloidosis in the heart. So these patients, they inflated both type, the wild type, as well as the hereditary or the variant or the, uh, the uh, g -g genetic types of cardiomyopathy. Uh, the sample population of 400 was, uh, was, uh, was selected to give some meaningful data for the analysis for him. And this data was analyzed by the primary efficacious endpoint by a very, very unique method, which is called a Finkelstil Schnoefeld method, which I couldn't grasp, but it was in herical combination of all cause mortality in herical fashions, frequency of cardiovascular rated hospitalization by the pooled affirmative data, that is 20 and 18 milligram doses were pooled in the common as taken as a compound versus placebo. And they also look at the many secondary key endpoints, which include changes in the on the in the six minute water test, as well as the consensus study cardiomyopathy questionnaire. So there were primary endpoints, which were looking at the hard endpoints, and there are soft endpoints, which mainly look to the quality of life and the baseline, the six minute walk test, because this increased the functional capacity of the patient. So what did the results show? So when did, before they see the result, we can see the distribution of the patients. So among the 441 patients, which were included in the study, nearly the blue bar indicates the patients with a wild type cardiomyopathy, and nearly a quarter of them were those people with a variant or mutation type of ATTR cardiomyopathy. And they include different types of mutations. Some of the mutations were mainly cardiomyopathy, and some were mixed with the cardiomyopathy and the peripheral neuropathy. The age were nearly mixed between the two groups, but the people with the wild type were more in the class uh, two, and the people with the heritage type were more in class three. And this is logical because the wild type develops over time, and the ATT cardiomyopathy much more earlier in the person's life. And the amount of ejection factors were nearly similar in this population. The results showed a very, very profound reduction in the all cause mortality. So the all cause mortality were reduced by 30% in the tephidomatous group as compared to the placebo. But there was a unique pattern that among the 30 minute study, not much difference between the all cause mortality was seen in the first 15 months and all the benefit was derived in the second half of the study. So we have to actually tell the patient that look, you're going to start the treatment now for you, but the main advantage of the longevity is you will see in the second half. So if you live for the first 15 months, there are chances that you will live for 30% more longer in the, uh, in the second half of the study for him. Then what about the time for the first cardiovascular hospitalization? This also was reduced dramatically by 32% in the tephidomatous group as compared to the placebo group. And this benefit in the cardiovascular hospitalization started early down the line. And as you can see, we need not wait for 15 months or 16 months to start the separation of the curve. The separation of the curve started early, as early as nine months. So the hospitalization had more far benefit earlier down the line than the mortality benefit. What about the secondary outcomes? The secondary outcomes, like we said, the first was the six minute water test, and there the curves diverged significantly. So by the end of the study, the people with the uh, tephidomatous the work for 75 minutes more than the people with the placebo. And these curves are separated very early in the study. So you can see at the time of administration, the patients start feeling symptomatically better. So not only the six minute water test increase, but the consensus questionnaire for the cardiomyopathy also changed dramatically from the baseline. So number of index point improvement was 13.65 in the patient with tephidomatous versus as compared to the placebo. So there were certain other benefits which I'm not showing. These benefits mainly linked to the improvement in the ejection fraction as well as the eco parameters because this was not the part of the pre-specific endpoints, but this data also shows some benefit for him. 
what about the analysis between those population who are having the genetic variant versus wild type variant so when you look at the population with the wild type variant versus the hereditary variant you can see the survival benefit was nearly equal between the two subsets wild type versus hereditary type but the risk benefit to the cardiovascular hospitalization was more more pronounced in the population of the wild type and like we said the wild type people are native bit early in the disease process than the hereditary type because the hereditary type starts the genetic process starts more more much more earlier in the life and overall the people who are less down in the severity scale such as the class 1 and 2 they derive much more benefit than the people in the class 3 with respect to the survival analysis as well as with respect to the cardiovascular hospitalization and this is also indicative that people with more higher function class were actually more advanced stage of the life they actually derived less benefit as compared to survival and the cardiovascular hospitalization the key lesson for us is that we should really aim to discover this patient very early and uh, there are many many ways for the nucleus scan but this is a matter for some other time i cannot go because possible time and once we discover we should really insist on our starting treatment for them early down the line the drug was very very well tolerated in this population So when you look at the data by the uh, Finkelstein-Schnorfeld method, you can see the p-value is very very significant, and the p-values between the two groups was 0.006. This indicates a very very high p-value. And among the people who were advised at 20 at 30 months, the big chunk of population, you can see they had actually 50 percent reduction in the hospitalization as compared to those people who did not survive. So if you survive, you actually not only you survive. you had less much more less chances of admission inside the hospital as compared to the population did not survive so there was a dramatic difference dr dabrish one minute left one minute left i will left. just take one more minute the unique thing about the trial was that 60 and 20 mg and 60 mg was taken as the common dose so our data paper came out in the 2020 which looked the effect of 20 mg versus the 80 mg and they have a new preparation which is actually 61 mg with the same therapeutic effect of 80 mg and the data showed that the 61 mg was far more better than 20 mg and this 60 mg preparation is what is available in ue and also available in the hospital so let me come to the end of my talk by saying only one slide that attr trial showed first time a medical treatment to reduce mortality and morbidity in the attr related cardiomyopathy a first time a medical treatment has been shown to reduce mortality and heart failure hospitalization in the population with the heart failure or preserved tissue infection who are having cardiac amyloidosis a first time a heart failure drug is effective on the heart end point by acting directly on the myocardium rather than peripherally which is the rna act or the neurohypermarcation so all the lgt inhibitors and the rna that peripherally for the first time a drug has been shown in the heart failure or preserved ef by acting directly on the myocardium and let me end my talk by saying that we have now three different pathways for amyloidosis we have tafavudavir for transthyretin amyloidosis we have uh, drugs which act on the cyclophosphate pathway for the light chain amyloidosis and for the systemic amyloidosis which is actually a chronic inflammatory disorder we have anti ir1 antibodies so now we have a much more clear pathway for the clinician what to do when we encounter a patient with amyloidosis depending on the etiology so thank you very much for your kind attention Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Amrish and Dr. Manuria. Do we have some time? Uh, Dr. Abhay Pandey wanted to know from you that how many cases you have seen of cardiac amyloidosis? How you diagnose? Yes. So, the, how many cases? Like we said, it is an unrecognized phenomena. But over last one year, because our hospital is one of the few hospitals in UAE which is, has got a has got a nucleus scan lab. now the whole emphasis of cardiac amyloidosis diagnosis the attr1 is shifted from the invasive technique to a bone scintigraphy so when we have a clinical suspicion we actually order three things at the same time we order for a nucleus scan which is actually done the bone scintigraphy which compares the radio isotope uptake of the heart versus the quantitative lung and this can be quantitative this can be qualitative and we ask for the immunofixation in the urine and the blood at the same time if you immunofixation negative and you have a nucleus scan positive this practically clinches the diagnosis of atrial cardiomyopathy so it is becoming a very very easy non invasive test and the whole results can be achieved in a few weeks time if the problem comes when the nucleus scan is a positive and you have a immunofixation which is positive in the blood in the urine in that case we are not sure it is a pass of monoclonal gammopathy which is affect the heart or is atrial cardiomyopathy in such case a tissue biopsy needed 
either from the heart or from tissue packs. So it is a little bit complex regimen. And one time, uh, Dr. Murray invited me, I will speak a little bit in more detail about it. Uh, thank As you. We now move on to the next session. You mentioned uh, dawn of a new era. So um, I think uh, there is a future for the treatment of uh, cardiac amyloidosis in future. Uh, with that, I thank you, Dr. Amish, uh, for uh, delivering a very nice talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Manoria. Yes, thank you very much. Our next uh, speaker is our dear President-elect, Cardiological Society of India, that is Dr. P.S. Banerjee. He's a Chief Interventional Cardiologist, Columbia Asia Hospital, Kolkata, former Head, Department of Cardiology, Medical College, Kolkata, former General Secretary and Treasurer, CSI, and former President, CSI West Bengal. I'll request Dr. Partho Sarkar to chair this session. Dr. Sarkar, please initiate. Dr. Sarkar? And if Dr. Banerjee, you can start your talk. Dr. Banerjee, please. Uh, can you focus the slides, please? I don't find my slides over the screen. Okay. So, thank you, Dr. Manuria, for inviting me to a nice symposium. And this is a very important symposium I have ever seen for over the last couple of years organized by Dr. Manodia. So I'll be talking on the management of the heart failure in the elderly. As you all know that there is a increasing survival age of the population in our country. So the incidence of heart failure is also increasing in the elderly. And it is often diagnosed very late because of subtle symptoms and the patients are often sedentary. So this is the problem of diagnosing it early and instituting treatment in the early part of the disease. Next slide, please. Now, the incidence of heart failure in the elderly, the heart failure is a complex clinical syndrome that can result from any structural or functional cardiac disorder that impairs the ability of the ventricle to fill with or eject the blood to the need of the tissues oxygen demand. Chronic heart failure is a disease with significantly higher prevalence in the elderly or patients older than 65 years. The elderly are more susceptible to heart failure due to several morphological and physiological changes related to the aging. More than 80% of the individual hospitalized for the heart failure are over the age of 65 and 24% of them are over the age of 85 years. Next, please. Now, this slide shows the physiological changes and mechanism of the aging and the prevalence of the chronic conditions as a functional age ad advances and top on the list is, as you can see, the arthritis. Uh, the percentage is around 44%. Then comes the heart disease. Then comes cancer, diabetes, COPD, asthma. So you can see from this slide that the incidence of the heart disease is also much more as we grow older. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Now, what are the causes of the heart failure? There are a number of possible causes of heart failure, which are the illnesses themselves. If the patients with these illnesses are identified sooner and treated appropriately, then the end stage of this illness might not result in the onset of the heart failure. Now, like you can see in the slides, the one of the important cause of heart failure in the elderly is the high blood pressure. So if you can diagnose the high blood pressure early and treat it, you can prevent the development of the heart failure. And we all know that the valvular heart disease is a very common factor, particularly in the uh, era four decades back, rheumatic heart disease was very much prevalent. Still it is prevalent in the rural areas of country and they can also precipitate heart failure. Now coming to the rhythm disorder, chronic atrial fibrillation is also a very important factor. Now heart muscle defects like different forms of cardiomyopathy starting from dilated and uh, restrictive or the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and other disorders of the heart can also lead to the heart failure, the most common being the coronary artery disease. Now next comes the lifestyle diseases like the obesity, the sleep apnea syndrome and excessive use of alcohol or drug misuse can also lead to the heart failure. Coming to the lung diseases, COPD, as you all know, the long-standing COPD can also result in heart failure. 
and there may be heart failure because of the pulmonary arterial hypertension, whether it is a primary or secondary pulmonary arterial heart hypertension, chronic pulmonary thromboembolism causing poor supply of blood to the uh, lungs can also result in heart failure. And some other medical conditions like anemia, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, obesity, and the uh, sleep apnea, as I already told, thyroid disease, and side effects of various anti-cancer drugs, they can also result in heart failure. And Chagas disease is another cause, although not commonly seen in our country, can also lead to heart failure. Next. Now, if you find in, from these slides, among the cardiac causes of the heart failure, 70% is constituted by the coronary artery disease, that is atherosclerotic coronary artery disease, and 10% each by the valve disease, the cardiomyopathies, and the other causes of the heart, which can lead to the heart failure. Next. Now, as you all know, the sign symptoms are very common initially, particularly in the elderly. The patient may remain totally asymptomatic because of the sedentary nature in the elderly age group. But there may be some atypical symptoms. Again, there may be typical symptoms, as you all know, like dyspnea at rest or on exertion, orthopnea, PND, etc. There may be biventricular failure leading to ankle swelling, enlargement of the liver, fatigability, and raised jugular venous pressure, third heart sounds, and displaced apical impulse along with the cardiac murmur. So these are the various forms we all know from the college days that how to diagnose a case of heart failure. Next. Now coming to the elderly versus younger, in contrast to the younger patients with systolic heart failure, the elderly patients with acute decompensation of the heart failure, more often present with the acute pulmonary edema and hypertension. So there may be a sudden rise of blood pressure leading to flash pulmonary edema leading to the heart failure. And this is more of a heart failure with preserve ejection fraction. And there may be the significant vascular contribution to the underlying pathophysiology in this form of heart failure. Conversely, in the elderly outpatients, the patient may present with a gradual onset of symptoms, atypical finding, including the loss of appetite, decrease in the body mass index, Whereas traditional heart failure symptoms such as shortness of breath may be absent or difficult to interpret due to the lack of specificity. Next slide, please. Coming to the chronic heart failure, which can be classified as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, mid-range, and the preserve ejection fraction. Now, as per the preserve ejection fraction, we all know that where the ejection fraction remains more than 50%, and it is often called as diastolic heart failure. And in this situation, the heart is concentrically enlarged. There is no cavity dilatation and the endastolic volume usually remains normal. And there is a high ratio of mass volume index. So it is more of a diastolic heart failure. And here actually no specific treatment uh, exists till date. Only you have to treat the underlying cause or you can give a small dose of diuretic or spironolactone to relieve the pulmonary edema. Mid-range ejection fraction, not much known in the literature about this condition, where the ejection fraction varies between 40 to 49 percent, and treatment depends upon which one is predominant, whether it is the reduced or it is in the uh, preserve ejection fraction. Now, the most important pattern of the heart failure we encounter in clinical practice is the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, where the ejection fraction is less than 40 percent, and there is a cavity dilatation called eccentric dilatation with raise in the endastolic pressure, decrease in the wall thickness, and there is a low ratio of the mass volume index. And guideline-directed medical therapy are available with this kind of reduced ejection fraction. And there are also device therapy, and there are also other conditions like mitral blood clipping. And at the end stage, we can also give the management with cardiac transplantation. Next slide. Now, classification of the heart failure, we all know that in our HA class, there are four classes. So in the class one, there is a low limitation of the physical activity. Class two, there is a ordinary physical activity results in symptoms. And class three is less than ordinary physical activity causes symptoms. And finally, the class four, where even the symptoms occurs at rest. So these are the different classification of the heart failure. Next slide, please. Now, coming to the other uh, classification, as per the ACCF and AHA 2013 guidelines, the stage A, that risk of heart failure, but without structural disease or symptoms of heart failure. 
like patient has got hypertension, diabetes, or coronary artery disease, but there is no manifestations of the structural disease or the symptoms of heart failure. Stage B is the structural disease without the symptoms of signs of heart failure. And stage C is the structural heart disease with prior or current symptoms of heart failure. And finally, the refractory heart failure. Next slide, please. Now, pattern of ventricular remodeling are different for heart failure with redu reduced ejection fraction and that with the preserved ejection fraction. You can see from the, the slides that in reduced ejection fraction, there is volume overload, increased diastolic pressure, increased diastolic wall stress, and there is series of addition of the new sarcomeres, chamber enlargement, and eccentric hypertrophy. Whereas in patient with preserved ejection fraction, there is a pressure overload, increased systolic pressure, there is increased wall thickness, parallel addition of the new myofibrils, and there is wall thickening, and there is concentric hypertrophy. So these are the basic differences of the ventricular remodeling in the heart failure with reduced and the preserved ejection fraction. Next slide, please. The pathophysiology of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is that damage to the cardiac myocytes and extracellular matrix leads to changes in the size and the shape of function of the heart and increase in the cardiac wall stress. And this stimulates the activation of the neurohormonal hormones in the body, like the rash and the sympathetic nerve system also activated. There is a vasoconstriction, fibrosis, apoptosis, hypertrophy, cellular and molecular alteration, and finally, the myotoxicity. And these ultimately lead to the hemodynamic alteration, salt and water detention, leading to heart failure symptoms like dyspnea, edema, fatigue. And there may be maladaptive remodeling and progression of the worsening of the left ventricular function, leading to increased mortality and the mortality. And there is a death often from the pump failure or cardiac arrhythmias. Next slide. Now, elderly versus young heart failure, as you can see, the older patients, heart failure with preserve ejection fraction, mostly the gender is female, physical finding, presence of the S4 and minimally displaced apical impulse. The pathophysical mechanism is age-related changes in the cardiovascular structure and function, oxidative stress, vascular stiffness, skeletal muscle abnormality. Potential targets of the therapy is particularly you diagnose what is the cause of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and treat the cause, like treat the hypertension, exercise training, and also treat the peripheral uh, precipitating factors. Now, heart failure with ejection fraction, mostly the patients are younger and most often male, and cardiac enlargement is there with apical is displaced, presence of S3, and you can get the ischemic heart disease, neurohormonal activation, and left ventricular remodeling and dilatation. There is enhanced systolic volume, neurohormonal blockade, and decreased left ventricular remodeling. All are being used to treat this condition and thereby prevent the progression of the heart failure. Next slide. Now, various diagnostic tests of heart failure has been proposed, as you all know that clinical examination is most important, particularly the raised jugular venous pressure and the symptoms of heart failure. Chest X-ray is helpful to know the cardiac enlargement and the pulmonary venous hypertension. And then maybe six minutes work test helps in uh, uh, the diagnosis of the heart failure. Left to cardiogram may show different types of arrhythmias, bundle brand block, particularly the left bundle brand block and STD changes. Echocardiogram is the hallmark for the diagnosis of the heart failure, particularly the etiology, what is the structural disease present. And the blood test includes the count anemia to detect the anemia, creatinine, hematocrit, leukocytes, electrolytes, and thyroid disorders can be diagnosed by doing the thyroid profile. And blood glucose estimation is very important to rule out the diabetes. Now, biomarkers, as we all know that in heart failure, BNP and nt BNP are raised. And these are helpful not only for the diagnosis of the heart failure and also important for the prognostication. When the patient is discharged from the heart failure, if these biomarkers are raised, then they are more likely to get recurrent hospitalization and increased chance of mortality and the morbidity. Next slide, please. These are the various landmark trials, as you can see from the slides that solve DIG, RAILS, CBS, ATLAS, and so many trials. And the most important point to highlight in these slides that the average age of all these trials, the patient's age was 60 or above. 
So most of the patients suffering from heart failure are usually elderly and most of them having the ejection fraction that is the low ejection fraction and average of less than 40 to 45 percent. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Now coming to the management, the general principles of the management of the heart failure is usually the first of all, the lifestyle modification and then the restriction of salt and water. And coming to the guideline directed medical therapy, the following drugs are being used like beta blockers. ARNI, this is a new addition to the management of the heart failure. ACE inhibitor or ARB, aldosterone antagonists, vasodilators like hydrolyzine, isothorbide, dinitrate combinations. And in calcium, uh, channel, uh, IF channel blocker, evabradin is also very important, particularly the, when there is a tachycardia after the adequate doses of beta blocker being used or where the beta blocker cannot be used. Next slide, please. Now, issues and considerations surrounding the medication use in the elderly heart failure symptoms, mostly the non adherence because the elderly patient cannot tolerate many of the drugs and there is often drug to drug interaction. Patient often withdraws various drugs and there is reduced bioavailability of the drug. Often the half life is also changed and there is adverse reaction leading to poor compliance. And there may be the potential inappropriate medicines being used along with the heart failure medi medications. So this is a major problem in managing the heart failure in the elderly. So you have to start the medical treatment with the smallest dose and to find out whether the patient is developing any side effect or he is compliance with the medicines what you are giving and whether any other drugs are interacting with your heart failure drugs leading to poor response to the medical therapy of the heart failure. Next slide. Now, this is the DFIT trial, a guide to the management of the geriatric heart failure, where it discovers the essential aspects of the geriatric heart failure management, like diagnosis, the etiology, the fluid balance, the ejection fraction, and the treatment. Next slide, please. Careful history and the physical examination often may help to make a clinical diagnosis of the heart failure in the older patients and determine an underlying etiology of the heart failure. Now, determination of the fluid volume status by careful examination of the external jugular vein is the single most important physical finding during the initial and the subsequent clinical examination. Now, determination of the left ventricular ejection fraction is the single most important test after the clinical diagnosis of the heart failure has been made, which should be used as a guide to therapy, whether it is a preserve ejection fraction or a reduced ejection fraction. Next slide, please. Now, this is the DAPA heart failure Dr. Manuria has already discussed in length. And now it has been one of the important drug in the armament area of the medical uh, treatment of the heart failure. And when this DAPA glyphosate has been compared with the placebo, it has shown that significant reduction in the primary outcome, hospitalization of the heart failure, death from the cardiovascular causes, and death from any other cause. Next slide, please. A summary of the results of this double heart failure trial shows there is a reduction of the 30% in the heart failure related hospitalization, 18% reduction in the cardiovascular death and 7% reduction in the all cause death. So this is a very important addition of the management of the medical therapy of the heart failure. Next slide. Now clinical consideration in the pharmacological management of heart failure in the older patients they are the type of heart failure, whether it is a systolic or the diastolic or a mixed type. NOIH class of the patient, renal function because they do have other comorbid conditions like COPD, anemia, uh, life expectancy, time needed to produce an effect, goals of the care and target symptoms improvement, including the patient's preferences. The goals of pulse and blood pressure reduction with the heart failure medication, common drug interaction, which increase or decrease the concentration of the uh, given drug and produce the side effect. Next. So drugs to be avoided in the heart failure patient are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory corticosteroids, the non-dihydropyridine calcium blockers like the veropramil, diltiazem, antiarrhythmic class 1, and thioglitazine because it causes more fluid accumulation. Next. So in conclusion, heart failure in elderly patient demonstrates a worse outcome compared to the younger patient. There is sparse evidence exists for the disease management in this patient due to the two related issues like under-representation in the clinical trial and less frequent referral to the specialist attention. 
Elderly heart failure patients have a worse prognosis compared to the younger cohort because of the various comorbid conditions and the compliance failure. Targeted treatment strategies have been insufficiently developed for them. Present knowledge is limited by the enrollment of the patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction in most trials with the exclusion of those with increased frailty. Heart failure diagnosis and assessment in the elderly may require adjustment of the trial metrics with respect to the exercise capacity assessment and biomarker cutoffs. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Professor Banerjee, for your brilliant talk. I have one question that uh, over the time, Professor Manuja also described that DAPA has already become a very darling drug to all the cardiologists and all the physicians also. So I want to know in case of elderly heart failure patient, the place of Absolutely. DAPA and the place of vasodilators and digitalis right now, one or two indications where we can use digitalis, vasodilators and DAPA. Now the question of using digitalis in the heart failure usually indicated when there is a persistent tachycardia atrial fibrillation. Otherwise, digitalis does not show any mortality benefit. It only reduces the repeated hospitalization. So that is why digitalis is nowadays not indicated as a class one drug in the medical management of the heart failure. And as regards the uh, SGLT2 inhibitor, of course, if the patient can tolerate, if the patient is hemodynamically stable, if the patient is not volume depleted, so obviously this can be useful, particularly in the setting of reduced ejection fraction. And in the patient with diastolic dysfunction predominantly, I believe that you have to find out the cause and the treat the cause preferentially rather than concentrating on the mixture of the drugs. I think with this, we start, uh, stop this session. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee. And we now move on to our next session. And the next speaker, our next esteemed faculty is very close and dear to our heart. That is Dr. Shashank Joshi. He's an eminent diabetologist of national and international repute. He's chair ID of Southeast Asia, president of the Indian Academy of Diabetes, former national president API, RSDDI, in AIARRO, Dr. Shashank Joshi was honored by Government of India by awarding him Padma in 2014 in recognition of his efforts to the cause of medicine. And he has published more than 800 research articles in various peer-reviewed journals. And I'm sure you will enjoy the flashes of expertise during his discourse. Dr. Joshi, please. I'll request the chairpersons, uh, Dr. Samir Agrawal and Dr. Vinod Mittal to conduct the session. Dr. Samir uh, thank and Dr. you, Dr. Minoria. I think we have already introduced Dr. Shashank. He's a very close friend of mine. Uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Shashank, please. You are uh, muted, please. Yeah. Muted, okay. Um, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Am I, am I audible now? You are audible. And are my slides visible on the screen? Yeah, 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 yeah. You have to make it full screen. Yeah, let me just try that. You know, with this Mac is not easy to handle. So there is a play button. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, not okay. So uh, thank you, Professor Monoria. It's uh, indeed a pleasure. And I have remembered Professor Monoria for the last 30 years. I have been going to Bhopal and because of this lockdown, we are doing all this virtually. And uh, he has given me a very nice topic, diabetes reversal, the twin way. And we wish that diabetes can be reversed. We have 80 million diabetics on planet Earth and another 80 million which are there. We know that India and Asia is the epicenter for diabetes. We know it's a rapid economic development, urbanization, and mainly the change in diet, change in lifestyle, which has led to an explosive increase and 60% of the world's diabetic population lives in Asia and a reasonable percentage of that lives in India. And we know compared to the Western population, diabetes in our population occurs at a younger age at a lower degree of obesity and a BMI. So obviously this has been explosive and we need to stem this explosion. We as Asian Indians are thin fat, we have more fat, less muscle. We have sarcos, sarcopenia with abdominal obesity. Probably it's polygenic, monogenic is rare. And we know it's environmental. 
and it's the sedentary lifestyle and affluent uh, habit which has made all the difference. But the key cog in diabetes development on the Asian Indian phenotype is for the same BMI, we have different body composition. And here you can see the yellow being the fat mass and red being the lean mass. Patient A, patient B and patient C, you can see patient C is typically Caucasian, which has more lean mass and less fat mass. While patient A is typically an Asian Indian of Indian ethnicity, which has less lean mass and more fat mass. So we are thin fat Indians. As I said, we have more fat, less muscle, less muscle mass, and it's all in the mitochondria, they say, the skeletal muscle mitochondria. And it's all the oxidative phosphorylation, poor capability, which leads to the explosive nature of diabetes in Asian Indians. And we are sarcopenic. And it's all linked to diet. Across India, we are a carbohydrate country and a fat country with a very less protein percentage. And this was a star study which we published almost uh, six years back in BMJ Open, which we showed that across India, it is not just the South India which has carb and fat diet with less proteins. Actually, Central India has the highest amount of carbs with 70%. And mind you, these are diabetics and non-diabetic population. And in both these cohorts, macronutrient-wise, we are flushed with carbs and fats and very less protein. That's the big challenge which we have. So obviously, reversal initially was a hypothesis. And it is the British group of Roy Taylor and his counterparts which established this simple twin cycle hypothesis. It's excess calories which we eat which actually cause a fatty liver. And if there is a muscle insulin resistance which is pre-existing, then it triggers a liver cycle. So we get a lot of fatty liver which triggers a liver cycle. And there is resistance to insulin suppression of glucose production. And that will lead to hyperglycemia and that will blunt the basal insulin secretion. But the fatty liver will also lead to excess outpour of VLDL and triglycerides, which will actually go inside the islets of Langerhans in the, in the endocrine component of the pancreas. And that will lead to a blunted insulin response to the ingested glucose. And a pancreas cycle is there and we'll get a fatty pancreas. So it's fatty liver, fatty pancreas when you eat too much. It's as simple as that. And the underlying uh, pathophysiology is insulin resistance. And that's something which we all know that a twin cycle is activated when you eat too much. So can you correct that? The first people to reverse diabetes on planet Earth were surgeons. Almost more than 27, 28 years back, Oris et al. did this biliary pancreatic diversion. And they were able to normalize in obese people with type 2 diabetes with BMIs above 45, 50. For almost 10 years, they remained diabetes free. And that is the first time we got a clue that you can, type 2 diabetes is a reversible syndrome through bariatric surgery. And that was the first clue which we got. But Professor Roy Taylor kept on consistently looking at a severe caloric restriction, which is very similar to the effect of bariatric surgery in curing or controlling diabetes. And within either intervention, the liver fat content drastically drops down, the liver insulin sensitivity returns, the glucose levels turn to normal, and within eight weeks of this intervention of a drastic severe caloric restriction, the pancreatic fat content falls and obviously the insulin secretion is restored from the pancreatic beta cells. And clearly, therefore, if you create a caloric deficit in a diabetic patient, the body weight comes down, the blood glucose comes down, and you can see within seven days, the caloric restricted diet impacts liver fat and insulin action on the liver. So obviously, this needed documentation in a trial. And almost three years back, in December 2017, there was a Lancet study which was published in primary care center, which endorsed diabetes reversal with a low calorie meal. And basically, this was a randomized cluster open label trial done in United Kingdom by general practitioners who were randomly assigned to two, two groups. This is a direct trial, weight management program, which had a severe caloric restriction and control group, which was best practice care guidelines. Usually, these were individuals between 20 and 65, diabetes duration not more than 6 years, BMI between 27 and 45, and not receiving insulin. And clearly, you can see here that weight loss and quality of life both were impacted, and almost half of the participants after one year achieved a sustained remission to a non-diabetic state without drugs. And therefore, it was realistically possible that even in primary care, remission of type 2 diabetes was possible. Who responded better? Shorter the duration of diabetes, better the response. Younger the population, better the response. 
So obviously, this concluded a simple fact that naturalistic of type 2 diabetes can be reversed if you hit hard hit early in the first decade of a diabetic's life and if the person is not on insulin. So the answer to that is yes. So can we use technology? Can we use machine learning and technology to actually reverse chronic diseases to a healthy lifestyle and can we create a digital twin? Can we simplify metabolism and we know that every individual is different, every individual's response to food is different and changes over time in metabolism are also different. So can we use machine learning technology as an intervention to reverse chronic diseases? Because the biggest challenge in creating a severe caloric deficit is adherence. You know, I cannot do a 700 calorie diet, a 600 calorie diet, a 1000 calorie diet consistently over a period of time. So can we use technology? And obviously, can we create a digital twin which self-learns our metabolic milieu, which decides the cause and effects, predicts outcomes and reverses chronic diseases. So obviously, we have technology now, like we have a Fitbit, we have a CGM, we have a 24-hour blood pressure monitor. And can we pick up those health signals? Can we do quality of life signals on happiness quotients? And can we look at treatments which have been given to diabetics and then use this and guide them through a coach which is a health coach on precise nutrition, on amount of sleep and activity under medical supervision, precise medicine and give them insights through a coach to reverse diseases. So obviously a lot of people tried it. There have been usual care. Then of course we have this Vata Keto Diabetes Reversal Diet which reduced A1C by 1.3 and medications including insulin came down by 47%. And of course we have this twin technology which is now available even in India and United States, which can chronically reverse disease and stop medications and reduce A1C. So if you use that, you know, in a very, very structured manner, you can reverse diabetes in probably three-fourth, reverse hypertension. Dyslipidemia doesn't get totally reversed. Obesity can come down. The EGFR improves, the liver function improves, the pancreatic beta cell and insulin resistance improves, and the inflammation comes down substantially. So what is used in this technology? The first thing is we have this AGP or continuous glucose monitoring, which Dr. Sabo will discuss a little later on time in the range. And now we can actually see and plot that when you eat more, the glucose goes up. If you eat a carb, the glucose goes up. If you don't eat, if you do exercise, glucose comes down. So we can actually plot it and then create a digital twin and learn how the body behaves and try to do a predictive accuracy. And we can actually have a virtual CGM, which can create this. Similarly, we can actually measure the blood pressure through a blood pressure meter and create a, a blood pressure twin, a virtual blood pressure monitor, and collate that data and integrate that with health and happiness, because that's equally important because that predicts it. And the third major thing which we input is what is the metabolic response of food? I eat rice, Dr. Manoria eats rice, Dr. Samir Agarwal eats rice. The response to the food of Dr. Agarwal in Rotak, Dr. Manoria in Bhopal and Dr. Joshi in Mumbai is going to be different. Some may respond red, some may respond yellow, some may respond good. So remember that the food response is unique for each patient and it's very important to map that. And then once you understand that a particular food A, food B or food C is going to increase the glucose, we need to modulate it and from a red zone move it to a green zone, which means the glycemic response and the glycemic load is predictable. And that's something which machine learning can do very, very well and give advice. So we can predict a given patient what is the food, what is the meal, what is the combination and how often is the glucose response and give them stars, like less than three stars is red, three to three, four stars is yellow, and four to five stars is green. And obviously, we can predict it very well which food will respond better. So obviously, we can use nutrition, sleep, physical activity, medications, and coaching, including happiness, to actually make a difference. And we can generate evidence. So obviously, once we understand what we do, in such technological things is use sensors like CGM, blood pressure monitoring, ketone monitoring, which is very easy to do. 
body scale for blood uh, body weight measurements and a fitbit to measure physical activity and sleep then pick up all the blood works look at energy mood food log activity look at all the the chemistry look at detailed analysis of sleep deep sleep light sleep rem and symptomatology and integrate all these signals and try to pick up all the food elements whether they are macronutrients micronutrients and gut microbiota and integrate that with the happiness and healthy signals use machine learning tools and use technology so that we can get the right advice on what to eat how much to sleep how much to do activity what medication to down titrate and a coach hands holds you so this is very very doable and possible in the modern era and once you start doing it on people and this is what people do you can actually see that somebody who is taking 10 actions per day from all these gadgets and spending 6 to 10 minutes a day can actually go to two actions a day and two minutes a day without any food log so obviously health outcomes can be measured this is some published work which dr sabu and myself have done in this direction with the twin team of dr samanna from bangalore and we have seen that an average age of 48 average starting a1c of 8.8 average age of a diabetic around 8 years and 27 physician groups in the treatment we have tried in 90 days to reverse diabetes hypertension lipids in some way integrating it with happiness mood and symptoms and reduction of medication needs so it's not impossible not to do that so obviously we can look at those outcomes some of these outcomes were published last year and some of them are undergoing but we need to do an rct so currently in india we are doing an rct on diabetes reversal in india where we are looking at using some of the machine learning technology of twins to see whether it's possible in fact in india there are four centers multi centric which is enrolling now which we plan to enroll 350 patients in 3 years and also a us multi centric study is starting so obviously we can reverse diabetes by ensuring that we use some of these modern technologies and artificial intelligence with an app and integrate that with some blood work and member logs and make a change so obviously we are in precision treatment era and we can use artificial intelligence machine learning to actually see whether we can look at reversal of diabetes but obviously we are in times of plenty our body engines are still running in a famine mode we need to still eat healthy be active build good muscle and improve our mitochondrial function and as i said whether you can reverse diabetes or not our prevention mantra still remains the same eat less eat on time eat slowly eat in the morning eat the right food walk more of course try to do your 10000 steps a day sleep for a good 7 hours the best time to sleep is from 10 pm to 5 am and sleep well and on time and of course be stress free do some yoga do some positive thinking and smile so i am certain that what you listen to me today is that diabetes reversal is possible it can be possible surgically it can be possible by severe caloric deficit and it can also be possible to integrate all the modern age gadgets and use technology to reverse diabetes so what you listen you can learn what you get learn you can adapt and i hope that you can sleep on time today and sleep well and i thank dr manoria for allowing me to speak on this topic thank you so much for the opportunity uh thank you dr shashank for that uh, enlightening talk and telling very clearly that uh, reversibility of uh, diabetes is no more a myth it is to a large extent now a reality and calorie restrictions in during early years of diagnosis of diabetes can reverse uh, diabetes okay so uh, with this small remark uh, dr manore can we have one or two questions only one can... only one okay so we can have one question uh, from the audience Uh, Dr. Shashank, I will ask you. Okay. So, so now in this, as you said, you know, uh, the same food nutrient has different uh, uh, effects and different, uh, you know, uh, ethnicity and different, uh, you know, uh, regional uh, differences are there. So, what are the, mm-hmm. uh, you know, gadgets yeah. available to find out that mapping, as you said, food mapping? How we do it? Suppose rice, for that matter, as you had given an example. Yeah. So CGM is good enough to pick it up, what you eat and how you eat. Okay. So, so the rice Bansi will eat in Ahmedabad, Sunil will eat in 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 Indore, and Dr. Vinod Mittal will eat in 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 Delhi. Delhi, and I will eat. 
each one of us will have a different glycemic response okay you just okay. need a cgm and okay. get that cgm and understand it every day so mm-hmm. when you see a 14 day profile on the same food and the way we mix it for example the the rice with dal is different the rice with rasam is different rice with curd is different because the, the 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 glycemic index will be different and you can actually change that and modulate that Great, great, great. I think I think Dr. Manore is signaling that we are really running. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, so we yes, have to move. To I want you to sleep in time. There's a panel also happening uh, after this. So I, I want you to sleep in time. Absolutely. So okay. now we will have a.